Hi, it's my great pleasure to um, welcome Graham Hunt, the uh, chair of this next session. Graham volunteers with Renew. Uh, Renew once upon a time were the Alternative Technology Association. I've been getting their magazine since the 90s when it was called Soft Technology. Um, these guys are leaders in imagining our energy future. Graham, please um, join us. Right, th thank you, Heather. Um, it's an honour to be here and to chair this uh, <clears throat> first session and to hear about our community energy icons. Um, but firstly, I'll do some uh, shameless promotion of Renew. Um, if you don't know Renew, um, Heather mentioned our magazines, which is probably our biggest public exposure, but we do a lot of advocacy and project development and we also have local branches which work with with communities um, or within communities and so I would suggest that you reach out to if there's a local branch near you and we can help expand your network. I'm a co-convener of the Sydney branch of Renew and we, were, we have connected a fair bit with the local inner west community energy and I see Gavin's here this morning. We've done some cross-promotion. Um, I think we'll have representatives here today from our Gold Coast branch and our Illawarra branch, so um, please feel free to uh, reach out to us. So the first um, of our icons we are going to hear from today is uh, Daniel. And Daniel has been working in the energy industry for over a decade in several possession positions involving strategy and advisory to project product development and sustainability. He is representing Repower Shoalhaven and he's on their committee and he uses his experience and knowledge of the energy industry and has a big passion for more sustainable future. So I'd like to welcome Daniel. Ah, thank you, Graham. Um, as you can see, that photo is from a little while ago, but it was the best I could find. Um, it, my beard didn't just grow like that overnight. Uh, so thanks again, and I'd, I'd like to make a special thank to Heather and the team for putting on the Community Energy Congress. Um, looks like a great couple of days and really interesting topics and um, hopefully some good conversation and discussion off the back of it. Um, I know the title is Community Energy Icons, and I feel a little bit out of place uh, up here with my fellow speakers, um, but I am very happy to speak on behalf of Repower Shellhaven um, and the many community icons behind the work that they've done, um, which is quite significant. Um, listening to Steph, Stefan speak, it is clear that Australia is not unique and, and I think I can emphasise many of the points he made. Um, uh, I've worked in the industry with DNSPs, energy retailers for a number of years and understand those complexities and the difficulties and often the mixed motives at play, um, which can add up to a very confusing picture for the community um, and, and one of the things I think is really value is, is trying to simplify that and work with the, the community and sort of advocating for their values and that's something I'm quite passionate about. So, so who is Repower Shellhaven? I'll do, keep this quite quick. Um, community energy organisation established in 2013 with a strong track record in enabling businesses and other organisations to adopt solar power. Um, our mission is to facilitate the development and implementation of renewable energy um, and we, we operate within the south coast of New South Wales um, and the southeast um, section down there. Um, this obviously includes reducing carbon emissions, sus creating sustainable jobs and keeping the money local, um, really working with the community in that to, to lower power bills and keep that, keep that um, savings local. Um, 
I think it's important to note that this evolves over time, as, as I'm sure many, many of us here appreciate. Um, and we're really on that advocacy path now around electrification and the, a more equitable energy transition. Uh, just quickly on a couple of the projects there, uh, originally started um, with smaller community-based um, projects using a, quite a novel um, financing model. Um, and this was through seven companies and just over a million dollars across 23 different sites and roughly a megawatt of capacity. Um, I think what that innovative financing model really did was give the ability for community investors to start to, to invest um, based primarily on a, on a smaller amount. So it was, was able to sort of start at that lower scale and build up. Um, and another interesting side point is it wasn't necessarily geographical constrained. Um, we did get some investors from other parts of Australia, but but vast majority were local investors. So where do we go from here? And, and, and this is really what the crux of I'll talk to today is the larger community solar farm was the, the logical next step looking to scale up that smaller innovative community um, financing model to a larger community solar farm. So after a subcommittee was formed, um, we explored the, the solar garden concept, um, but after a period of time, it became quite obvious that was gonna be difficult and complex at scale um, for the Repower Group at that point. So the shift focused to how could they develop a solar farm um, aside from that, that community solar garden um, concept. Um, this involved a lot of engagement with the local council, which was super, super supportive at the time, and that really was a crucial aspect of identifying a site. Um, also working with Merrill Solar on, on the project design or the design and costings on, on a very modest budget. Um, and, and obviously, and quite importantly, high levels of engagement with the DNSP around connection and capacity uh, issues. Um, so there we got to the last point, and I think so essentially what was developed was a proof of concept. Once they'd found the site and had all the costings and that developed, it was really then how could this be de-risked and where was some potential financing going to come from. So with that proof of concept in hand, the group went out and shopped around to, to several energy retailers. Uh, here's a quick, quick overview of the um, project timeline. The system was commissioned in the end of 2021, so roughly a four and a half year project. And I think what this really speaks to most importantly is the commitment of the team and the, the core group, which many of, well, a few of which are still on the committee, um, but also their resilience and flexibility. So there was obviously a, a need to pivot and shift at some point, but um, it was important to remain flexible. And one other thing I'll call out, which was quite important is that obviously as community energy organisations, we rely quite heavily on the partners that we work with and are often um, dependent on their timelines. Um, and I think that's, you can see there really from the 2019 to 20, early 21 period is when the sort of development and planning um, process took place, which was, was quite a long period um, at that time, but really showed the commitment of the, the core group. This was also the period where we um, partnered with Flow Power. And so here you can see some of the core um, values or, or that mutually beneficial arrangement between Repower and Flow Power, um, essentially matching the strengths and needs of each partner. Uh, we had what they, they needed, which was the, the generation for a potential offtake agreement that they were working on. Um, and they, what, they had what, what we needed, which was really that financing um, and the de-risking component, um, which was quite important. Uh, here's a, a quick slide on the on really from a flow power perspective. I think as I mentioned earlier, there were they were working on an offtake agreement with City of Sydney at the time. Um, the Shellhaven Solar Farm could become part part of that, um, and also given the amount of work that had gone into developing the proof of concept and, and all the design and work around that, it was really largely advanced at that point. So it made it quite a quite a nice project for, for Flow Plow to, to work with us on, um, especially around leasing and site identification, which I'm very sure many of you are quite well aware of when it comes to projects of this nature. 
quick slide on the metric. So it was roughly a four megawatt solar farm, uh, all up around about five million in cost. Um, significant emission reductions, as you can see there. And quite importantly, it is battery ready should uh, project partners look to pursue that um, at a future date, which is, is quite important and, and potentially getting more and more important um, with the energy transition. A uh, quick overview of the project outcomes, and I think I'll call out a couple of important points here, is at the core of, of the project and, and right from the beginning it was about keeping it as local as possible. Um, this is really about representing the community but, but ensuring that there is that social acceptability and that, that alignment between the community um, and, and the, the project. Um, and the other really important point is the, the strong collaboration between partners, both public and private organisations. Um, I think that speaks to the value, at least um, in a large part, of Repower Shellhaven in offering that, that social licence, um, but also working on the social acceptability around projects of this nature and building that trust amongst the community. So key take home messages, uh, community investment appetite was massive. Uh, we leveraged a lot of what had, had been built from the smaller community um, <coughs> projects earlier on, um, investors and, and members. Uh, consistent and early engagement, I think really, really speaks for itself. Um, and this is quite apparent when you do need to shift um, approach or slightly pivot in, in certain ways um, and you have good partners around you. Um, the PPA is really around the risk mitigation piece and I think that's quite important and, and becomes more and more important as you get towards the end of these, these kind of projects is that you understand the risk you're taking on as a community organisation and the risk you're um, happy to accept, I guess, to that extent. And that's where the partnership with Flow Power have really, really um, helped with, in that situation. Uh, last point there, I think, is, is more a now issue is that yes um, these projects take a number of years to get built but then they will exist for s several many years afterwards and it's important to understand that I guess from the beginning to make sure that there is a handover when they are complete and they do fall on to, to somebody else to, to maintain and operate um, and the experience and knowledge within the community organisation is transferred to the future members and, and, and along those lines so we're very fortunate to have a couple of key uh, members from that time still on the committee, but um, I think over time it's important to ensure that that knowledge is um, really transferred. And it's particularly more important around the smaller community-based projects early on, where um, Repower is responsible for the monitoring and um, maintenance of those sites. Looking from a project management perspective, um, regularly transparent uh, communication between partners, I think, speak for itself. The local, local, local piece is something I've mentioned a couple of times now and I think is quite obvious and, and again, super important to be, be conscious of and remain conscious of during the whole project. Um, and again, that really speaks to sort of that social buying and ensuring that the community and the investors um, are really on board and understand. Um, and lastly is the probably the more boring point, but, but becomes quite important once you get towards the end and sort of the real operational life of these projects is ensuring that you have agreements and structure in place that really solidifies those values um, that, that throughout that project. And I think, I'm not going to bore you, we've got some really fancy diagrams that we could have put up here around sort of what it all looks like and I'm sure many of you have seen these before. Um, they are very important. They're important from a risk management perspective, obviously, but they're also important from a community and a community investor perspective. Uh, we need to ensure that it is understandable, um, but also apportions that risk where it best lies. Um, and that is it. Thank you very much. Right, thank you, Daniel. And um, yeah, it's, I guess, the reinforcement of Community and collaboration um, is, is so important there. We will have a, a Q and A session at the end, and we'll bring all the all the speakers speakers back up. Um, so the next speaker I'd like to introduce is uh, Anne Kennedy, 
who's here representing Zen. That's a, that's a great name. Um, the Zero Emissions Noosa Incorporated um, and has significant experience in, in working in public, private and non-profit organisations. 15 years ago, she set up a clean tech, low emissions um, organisation in Noosa, and that's been doing a lot in that area. So I'd like to introduce Anne. Thank you. Thank you, Graham, and uh, thank you, Heather, and all the people behind this uh, wonderful conference to give a voice to community energy, which I think is an in people are realising is an increasingly important um, part of the transition process. So uh, we're uh, quite different to Repower Shoalhaven. So just a quick um, run through why we started. Uh, in 2016, Noosa Council had a policy target of zero net greenhouse gas emissions by 2026 with a community group that was started to help to implement that in the Noosa community. Uh, and at that point, uh, the Queensland Government were in their very early stages of their re transition to renewable energy journey. We um, do the big uh, chunk of that pie chart on the diagram there. The Council do the little chunk. That's about their emissions. We're about the emissions of the community. And we concentrate on... Um, household and um, business emissions reduction and also transport. Our vision is, as I said, reducing the greenhouse gases in the community. Our mission is about addressing climate change through that emissions reduction. So we limited our scope to um, business and household and um, transport emissions just to make it manageable. And we um, add value to the Noosa Council and community through those uh, ways of working with the community. So we've basically had a very strong collaborative relationship with our local council. Very fortunate to have that. Uh, many of our projects are cutting edge and um, groundbreaking, and that's unintentional. Um, this is about the, uh, the why we did it. Um, one of our projects is community batteries, and the reason we tackled that is because we had large uh, um, solar installations that couldn't actually send any of their excess back to the grid. So we started looking at the solution for that. It turned out to be a community or neighbourhood battery and we're very fortunate to have one of the uh, batteries promised by the previous Shadow Minister for Climate Change and Energy, Chris Bowen. And that's actually um, in the process of being worked through now for uh, pr procurement and installation. Um, we're one of the community partners for uh, rewiring um, Australia and fortunate to work with that great organisation to look at um, ways that we can reduce uh, emissions in our community and save money for our households. Solar for Strata was another project that happened because we have a significant number of strata title complexes, both holiday um, business and uh, residential in the coastal area of Noosa. We've got a great uptake in Noosa Shire in the hinterland area of solar, but not so great in the coastal area, and that's because of our high concentration of solar. So we've worked on eight case studies uh, that were funded by our local council, and we've got now got an online manual that is available to anyone across Australia on our website, free of charge, and a video about how you do that to help introduce to bodies corporate um, some of the ways to get around the barriers. We've got um, a number of other projects where we've been working with local communities or advocating on um, through schools. We do data analysis um, to have that evidence base. We have an annual um, EV expo. We've had five. We've now this year increasing that scope to be uh, electri EV expo and electrify everything on the 16th of June. So if anyone feels like a weekend in Noosa, come and join us. We'd love to see you. And that's about... Um, now we've got 60% of our uh, attendees at that expo who've actually been before. So they might have bought their EV. They're now looking for the next step. So it's about um, helping them on the journey to uh, increase the ways that they can electrify and uh, contribute to the transition. 
projects around um, walking and cycling. We've had a, another school project um, that has helped young people in the area to get an understanding of what's involved and how they can be involved. How do we do it? We have a board, we have two working groups, one around our electricity or energy projects, one around our transport projects, three subcommittees to help the internal operation of the organisation. We advocate, we engage with the community to help raise awareness and behaviour change, or, or do behaviour change, and we collaborate with lots of local community organisations and other key stakeholders. Energex are even now talking to us after the, about the community battery project. Uh, about two years ago, we went to talk to them and they basically sort of said, well, why do we need to talk to you? Now I think they realise <laughs> they have to change their business model and um, groups like ours might be able to um, be involved on that journey. So what are the lessons from uh, we've learned in working in the community energy sector? Well, obviously you need funding and we've been very uh, lucky to have a supportive council that have contributed funding to a number of our projects. The community battery project, we actually have a grant from the Queensland Government to do another part of that and that is uh, a roadmap to uh, uh, highlight to other local groups how they can go on the community battery journey. So that um, will be available after April when the final report is done. We've got support from key stakeholders and that's a lot of relationship building and I'm sure lots of people in the room have done lots of that over the years and um, know the work and time that goes into that. We've got evidence-based projects and I think that's really important to get the support of your local councillors and key stakeholders. We had a very strong uh, founder and core group who was previously a local councillor, so um, she knew you know, what it took to get involvement of some of those key stakeholders. We need continual renewal and succession planning, and I think Daniel um, alluded to that, about passing on the knowledge because everybody doesn't stay around forever. And uh, focus on the message for your target audience. We don't talk in Noosa about saving the planet. We talk about cost saving. And that saving the planet obviously happens as a result of people making the transition and uh, seeing how much money they save. If we're looking to uh, relate that to the, the themes of this conference, fast, vital and agile, um, Daniel used the word pivot. We've done a lot of pivoting. <laughs> I can see him smiling. Um, you've got to be agile and able to pivot because this is a fast moving space. We're all learning together and um, you just have to move how you need to move. Um, vital is cutting edge. We're all on the cutting edge. We're all learning as we go and it's great to see so many people here today that we can all learn from and, and uh, share um, stories with. And um, Heather talked a lot about the FAIR component in her introduction, so being consultative and um, being FAIR in how we get that process happening is really important. But I'd like to leave you with three th uh, things that I think we need to do in the community energy sector, and that is to realise that um, these three parts of the theme from the, the Congress is that we have to advocate for community energy, as I think those of you who might have heard Allegra Spender in the Smart Energy Conference in her session uh, say, it's up to everybody to advocate. We have to strongly advocate for seats at the table with the key stakeholders and decision makers. Community energy is the missing link in the transition process at the moment, and um, that needs to be very front and centre on the state and federal policy agendas um, at all levels of government. It is in some states, not in others. So uh, we have to advocate for that to happen. We have to um, advocate uh, that community energy is the missing link because households are 30% of our um, energy generation and a very important component in the energy transmission space. So it's about making that um, noise loud and clear for people to realise the importance of community energy. And lastly, it's about valuing uh, community energy because things like neighbourhood and community batteries can really help reduce transmission at local um, sites, whereas there's some social licence difficulties with um, grid connection, et cetera, that are happening in rural and regional communities. So I think um, if we do nothing else out of this Congress but um, increase the profile of those three things, we will have all had a great Congress. So thank you and look forward to hearing your stories.
Jeff has come from Newstead in Victoria. He moved there with his family in 1986 and has been involved in numerous um, community building initiatives, working to harness the skills, knowledge and energy of local people. Um, in his other activities, he's a director of Natural Decisions, a small consulting business specialising in environmental decision making. He's also a naturalist, bird photographer and a writer. So would you please welcome Jeff. Thanks, Graham. Um, <clears throat> and thank you all for coming to listen. Let's make sure I can press the buttons. Uh, I'd just like to firstly acknowledge the Gadigal people of this land as the traditional custodians and um, also like to state at the outset that um, I come from Newstead in central Victoria, which is uh, Jajarung country. And this is actually a photograph of some of um, that land and there's a solar farm on it. That photo was taken about uh, two months ago. Um, if you'd taken the photo in November of last year, it would have been a bare paddock with a fence around it. So for us as a community, uh, it's been um, pretty sensational and affirming to see this solar farm emerge. And I just want to take you through the story of that and hopefully there are some lessons there that are valuable for you. Just very quickly, a little bit about our, our community and our town. We're, we're, only a, we're a village, really. 600 people or so live in Newstead. If you got everybody to stand in a circle that says they come from Newstead, there's probably a 1,000, so some of the outlying villages. We're pretty typical of regional Victoria. We do have a pretty fast-growing community. We're one of the fastest-growing um, small, small communities in the state because we sit sort of... Um, you know, in that annulus around Melbourne where people want to get out of the city but they don't want to be living in the Mallee. And so it's a very attractive place to come to. If you look at our sort of socioeconomic situation, we're pretty diverse. We're sort of, we would be classified as slightly disadvantaged socioeconomically. And that's been one of the things that's been driving us in thinking about this project. As a community, though, we sort of like to get things done. People often refer to us as the, Rep the People's Republic of Newstead. We like working with other organisations, but we don't tolerate nonsense and we get on this stuff rather than get, uh, let things get in our way. That's the Newstead Pool. It was built in 1962 by Bruno Grollo, but it was actually boot was his first project. He poured the concrete slab for the pool. But it was actually built by the community to stop the kids swimming in the river, because that was dangerous. Um, this is our community garden, which was established in 2010, right at the end of the millennium drought, because people didn't have access to water, and a lot of their vegetable gardens weren't thriving in town, and we managed to get access to a community bore and established a community garden. And lastly, I'd love anybody here who wants to come to Newstead, please, um, get your passport and you can come. If you're an artist, you've got special treatment because there are thousands of artists in our community. Um, hundreds, I should say. Um, and we've converted our old, uh, our old railway station into an arts hub. But these are all community projects which have arisen out of the need to do something that would be a benefit to our community. So, What's the story with the solar farm? Well, back in 2008, we had a community meeting, a summit, when Kevin had his summit in Canberra. We thought none of us are going to get a gig to go to Canberra to contribute to that. So we had our own summit. 150 people turned up. A whole bunch of ideas were thrown on the table. One of them was, we need to do something with renewable energy. But at the time, that there, was sort of, there wasn't a project to sort of focus on. We had to sit and ponder for a while to see what we could come up with. And but some of the, the, the principles, I guess, which were established way back then in about 2008, 2009, were that if we were going to do something in this space, here were the underlying principles. And if there was one thing I would leave you with today, I'd get you to think about these principles. 
The first thing was that we were aiming to be 100% renewable. The second thing is we wanted to, it to be a project where people could opt in, okay? We wanted to be grid connected. I've lost track of the number of times people have said, oh, I've heard you guys are disconnecting from the grid. Well, that was never gonna happen. In fact, that would be the last thing that would happen because people in our community are very sensitive to the fact that, you know, they're, the risk of actually being sort of isolated and grid connection is just one of those aspects. We wanted it to deliver community benefits and the last point was we wanted the project all the way through to do no harm. And that is, you've only got to drive from Newstead to Ballarat through the Ausgrid, sorry, Ausnet um, proposed sort of extension there to see the way that a community can get very quickly agitated and active about something that's happening in their community that they feel that they don't have control over. And, um, yeah, we wanted to make sure that we didn't violate that last principle. So, very quickly, like, I'm, I think Daniel said there was a, the photo was out of date. Well, mine is really out of date. Um, we started on this way back in 2011, really, when we partnered with the Central Victorian Solar City Program. They came to us because they were having trouble getting people engaged beyond about 15 or 20 per cent of their community. We actually said, look, if you work with us on a local sort of knowledge network sort of model where people just connect with each other, we reckon we can get lots of engagement. Well, we got 80% of our households had home energy assessments because we organised our own local networks to conduct those energy assessments. At the time, we got very excited. We wanted to do something, you know, build a solar farm or a nuclear reactor. No, only joking. But we examined a whole bunch of ideas. Then in about 2015, the state government, and I'll come to the state government in a moment because they've been an incredible supporter, um, gave us some funding to develop a business case, which has ultimately led to a much bigger proposal, which they backed in 2019 to help build a local solar farm. So we worked over a period of time, slowly um, building up our ideas and our sort of information and our community engagement around what might work that will deliver those benefits uh, to our community. So we really started on the solar farm itself as the solution in about 2019. So we're gonna build a solar farm. What do we need to do? Well, we had to identify and secure a site. Three stars means we've done it, okay, that's sorted. We formed a partnership to construct, finance and operate the farm. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Tick. We're working with Flow Power, who's our project partner, to develop a retail or to, to understand the retail offer that they have that goes with the farm and with their product. And that's in progress. We've engaged with our community along the way. COVID sort of put a bit of a hold on some of this, but we still managed to do it pretty well, I think, during that time. I would say we've still got a little bit of work to do that yet because the farm itself hasn't been commissioned. But we, you know, we had one objection to the building of the farm. So we got our planning approval. The planning approval is actually for twice the footprint of what the, the farm is actually operating on at present, or sorry, going to be operating on, so that there is room for expansion. But it's still pretty boutique and build and connect the farm to the grid, well, we're hoping that's gonna happen in May. Everything's on track now. It's been going really, really rapidly since November, and we look like we're gonna meet that target. So a few quick facts. There's a picture of the panels. There's, um, it's about a six hectare site. It's three megawatts in size, so it's sort of similar size to what Daniel was talking about with uh, Shoalhaven. Um, 4,300 panels, they're tracking, so they, they're, they're pretty neat. And it also includes a five megawatt hour battery. I think the battery is arriving today. The foundations were poured earlier in the week. So that's very exciting. And as I said, we're on track for grid connection in 2024. So flow power, I need to put my glasses on, sorry. So flow power will own, operate, and retail the electricity from the farm. So I was thinking about um, those principles at the start about what is community power. I'm not sure that we really meet those principles 
all that well, but I would still say it's a community energy project. Um, matching community expectations and commercial realities has been pretty challenging. I mean, some people think that doing something like this is going to give you a free lunch. Well, you're still going to have to pay for power. Um, you're still probably going to have to pay fairly close to what's out there in the, in the market. But in this case, it's, it's a different model because it's, we think of it as our solar farm, even though Flow Power own it and operate it. Um, they responded to a nationwide tender call. Um, we had, I think, about 20 respondents. Some offered the whole three elements of this, you know, the financing, the building and the operation. Um, some of them just offered various bits of it. So we took a chance with Flow Power, but I'd have to say we've, we've, had, we've had some pretty ordinary experiences with some previous operators in the early days. But Flow Power have been fantastic. They have shown us respect and trust that it, it operates from their CEO right down to the guy that's you know, doing the site management on the build. They, there's something going on in the values and the culture of that organisation that we think is really special. So I would just give them a really big shout out as being a great company. We got about a million bucks of state government funding, a little bit over, and that covers about 15% of the total cost of the project. So that was something that I don't think was apparent to a lot of folks early on. And um, yeah, so just to emphasise that we couldn't have done this without that partnership. Thanks, Graham. The retail offer, um, there's a bunch of us trialling that at the moment. We've got about 200 people signed up ready to go when the farm starts operating. We've done some pretty rigorous testing of it. We reckon it's sort of around 5 to 6% better than the best offer you could get out there in the market from a, you know, a black VDO and probably about 10 to 15% between below the, the best green offer. Um, their flow power is very excited about the technology. I'm not. Not many people in our community are, but over time I think the interest there will increase. Victorian government, I just endorse a couple of things that have been said already. Lily D'Ambrosio as the energy minister in Victoria, it's, it's quite remarkable that she's been in that gig for nearly a decade now. And the trust and the patience that she has shown, along with our local member, I just think has been extraordinary. Um, I have a natural distrust of politicians, and but I would have to say, in Lily and Marie's case, just absolutely enduring support. And the team from that sits behind her at DECA also have been really terrific. A great collaboration. Just to finish off, we're a group of about five or six people. We've been meeting monthly for four years, fortnightly, probably for the last 18 months. The number of volunteer hours that have gone in from these half a dozen folks is extraordinary. Um, we've got different skills, we've got different opinions, we've got different values, but we've worked out how to operate together. Um, we are very aware of the social licence that is required to make a project like this operate. It's a community problem solving project that happens to be about energy, not the other way around. The next project that I'm going to put my energy into is linking our streetscapes and trying to make it easier to walk around our town in temperatures that are getting hotter each year. So just to finish off, that's a photo that I took a couple of weeks ago. Um, as I say, it's boutique. It's not, you know, provides about twice of the energy needs of our town. We think it's a really important part of the branding of our community. It's something that we've achieved as a community uh, for benefits that enable everyone in our town to be able to access um, affordable renewable energy. And um, it's been a, I'm very tired, but it's been a great project and it's been great working with a team of folks over the last decade or so to turn this into reality. So thanks for listening. Uh, thank you, Jeff. Um, I'd like to now ask our three icons to come come to the stage, and, and we can um, start uh, answering some questions. We've got uh, the time's shortened, so we've only got 15 minutes. Can I, 
<coughs> First question, it's not, I guess it's generally for all of you, what was the investment model? SP, SPV with a fixed number of shareholders? Sure, I can answer that from our perspective. Um, yes, it was an SPV with, um, I think it's limited to 20 unsophisticated investors. Um, and that was, again, from our perspective, essentially the same model we used across the smaller community um, based solar projects that were on actual community buildings. Um, but yeah, just replicated that and that, that, that formed part of that, that $5 million that, were, that, that went towards the, the larger community solar farm. I should pass too, but like early on, we surveyed our community and talked to people extensively about whether they were interested in sort of a community ownership model. And it was pretty clear that they weren't for two reasons. One was they felt the risk was too great. And secondly, they didn't have the dough. And we could have easily found maybe 20 or 30 people who would have put in some money, but nothing near what would be required to get us to where we've got to. And that sort of perhaps answers the next question, which was directed to you. Can you give more detail of why, why you feel your community owns it when technically low power owns it? Why do I feel like we own it? Yeah. Um, because we can go and point to it and we can tell a story about how it was created. It wouldn't have, been, it wouldn't have happened without the community, but the reality is that flow power, um, they legally own it, they operate it, they look after it, they'll be responsible for dealing with it at the end of its life, but I have great confidence that they'll do a good job. And the notion of working with a commercial entity, for some people in our community was like, you know, oh, you know, they're the bad guys, aren't they? But they're, they're not, it's just, it's the reality that you have to partner with people that fill the gaps that you can't fill. Um, I can just comment on that in relation to our community or neighbourhood battery because if it wasn't for Zero Emissions Noosa doing the two years of research behind getting to the point where we had a project that was shovel ready to engage with a, a stakeholder or partner who helped us with all the technical advice, advice and that was Yarra Energy Foundation, um, that project wouldn't have got off the ground and also with the support of Noosa Council. We can point to that as a, as a community initiative and it will be the only community-owned community battery in Queensland because all the others will be um, owned and operated by DNSPs. Ours will be owned by Noosa Council, operated by Acacia Energy, but with a lot of work from Zero Emissions Noosa there in the background. OK, thank you. And this is one for all of you. Um, if you can answer it, I guess, succinctly is... Now that you have a decade of experience, what do you wish you knew at the beginning of your journey? <laughs> um, oh, really quickly, I think patience, but also understanding that, yes, it's great to be overly ambitious at the start, but, but mindful that you do have to temper that, I think, as the, as the process um, evolves and the journey continues. Persistence and renewal because, uh, yes, it takes a long time. You've got to persist. There'll be lots of barriers in the way and renewal is about uh, continuing to have, as Daniel said in his talk, that um, passing on of knowledge and uh, energy to newcomers to help keep projects alive. Probably stupidity. If I had my time again... <laughs> I, honestly, if I had my time again, I wouldn't have started as part of the group, but it's actually been the group working together that's kept me going and the confidence and the support that we've had from some of the other stakeholders, including government and flow power, that sort of, you know, at the end, you, you just can't back out because, like, why would, you, why would you stop close to the end of a race when you reckon you're just about going to get there? Yeah, thank you. Um... A question for Anne. How can other community groups get local councils on side providing financial and in-kind support? Uh, a lot of hard work behind the scenes. Um, we do a lot of briefing of councillors about what we do and why we do it. Um, we had the council policy, as I mentioned uh, in the beginning, that was the initiator for forming Zen. So, obviously, they had 
a supportive policy intent, but um, really few resources to help make that happen. So it's um, really about building that relationship and that trust. And I think showing that you can help them be a leader in this space, which is how we got the community battery project over the line. It was really about um, their support and uh, giving kudos to them to be a leader in this space in Queensland. Another question for Jeff. Is there a community benefit sharing model or local use of power generated at the solar farm? Uh, not specifically. The Flow Power will be running a, like an annual community grants program. Um, but we don't... like The retail offer that our residents will have access to will be exactly the same that you guys have access to. But um, so from that point of view... Um, you know, the, the community benefit really comes sort of from some intangible aspects in terms of it being a local um, renewable energy source and also the grants program that we're operating. Um, and we'll be working over the next few years with our community to help them understand how they can actually save more money by becoming wiser consumers of, of energy. Um, Daniel, you spoke a lot about community investors. Can you describe a profile of your community investors? Um, I think we, we, we discussed this quite detail the other way back. I think there's, it, it's definitely not the same now as it was back then. Um, the, there's definitely a lot more, I guess, appetite um, for community involvement at this stage. Um, interestingly, a proportion of our investors were um, older retirees just looking to do their bit. And I think that is probably quite common across um, a number of our investors. Is it, it The way we structured the, the financing model was that you could invest a smallish amount, I mean, a modest amount, around three, four $4,000, but it, it opened it up to those people who did just want to do something um, and just do their little bit. And I think just from a purely technical perspective, there are people that couldn't get access to solar, so it fitted perfectly. Um, that that's those with apartments or, or renters or, or people without the roof space. So um, there, there was there's a mix there, and I think it's important to be conscious of that, and that that will shift over time. Um, can we? realistically expect these models to be replicated in thousands of communities across Australia? If so, what is needed to help facilitate this at scale? I'll throw that open to the floor. Passionate volunteers um, that have time, and I think Daniel uh, hit the nail on the head there. It's the retired professionals in the community in Noosa. We're lucky to have a very articulate um, and retired community with professional backgrounds. Some of them have technical skills, a lot of them don't. A lot of us have learnt what we know um, being on this journey, but it's having those passionate volunteers to start the process and continue it. Just jumping off the back of that, I think diversity among that committee, and while it's hard, obviously, to get volunteers, it, there are specific roles that you need, and I think that's, that's something that you find, and particularly as sort of the world evolves around the social media space and those kind of things, is it's important to, to engage at that level um, and so looking for those, those different skill sets um, is very important and I mean, but, but also tricky. So just slightly different angle. Um, in our case, we, well, I just retired two weeks ago, but the, all of us on our committee working full time and volunteering, that's just how it rolls in Newstead. And uh, I think the thing that I would say is though that be very wary of technical experts, especially if they're, you know, so-called um, experts, because we we found a number of trusted people early on. One person I should have mentioned in my talk, Tosh Sato from Energy for the People, who I'm sure some people here would know. Without Tosh, this wouldn't have happened. He knew stuff that we would never know. And he somehow decided that we were a sensible professional group to work with from the early days. And so we didn't need to become experts in things that other people are experts in. But it's those principles that I put up halfway through my talk, they're the things that I think are important, as opposed to 
replicating the technical solutions because they'll be different in every different context, I think. The next question is that one I was considering asking is, is the amount of effort that volunteers have to put in. Um, I've experienced this myself in terms of how you get people to maintain that energy and, and make sure the group continues, you know. Um, people waver over time. I know it's a big challenge, but if any insights would be helpful. Find their passion and tap into it. <laughs> We've got um, people who, for example, come along and video our community forums, um, do our social media. They don't necessarily have any, any technical knowledge of the projects, but their uh, passion and values are in the transitions um, space. So find that passion and tap it. Uh, there doesn't seem to be any more questions there unless we have any from the floor. We just have a couple of minutes. But I am just reminding us we've only got a couple of minutes. But I want to touch on that volunteerism because congratulations to all of these projects for the enormous amount of volunteer contributions. But I find that very frustrating that they, we can't get some sort of matching um, either human resources or funding resources. And the three projects that you've described here you have to have something coming in, finance-wise, but it... And these stories are so important. I just... What's your question? My question is a rant. <laughs> <laughs> Could you just talk a little bit, perhaps, about the, with the community battery project that you've done, what the model is for consumers or the, the community to use it? And have you had to do anything special with the DNSPs to create tariff reform or different mixtures to try and make these things viable? And have they been engaging or where are the problems lie? Uh, watch this space is all I can say. That's all um, negotiations that are taking place at the moment and particularly your point about tariff reform. Um, yes, our DNSP is wanting to charge uh, $6,000 a year, <laughs> which... Um, is quite different to other states which have $600 a year. So I think there's somebody got a typo there along the way. Um, and so we're negotiating with them now. And I think that's part of our, um, our job here is to advocate to those key stakeholders about these situations and why they need to change. OK. Yes. Well, um, Thanks. We've almost managed to finish on time, which is great. So just a last chance for everyone to say a final word. Um, I think mine is just really echoing um, the points that we've all made up here. It's just that it, it's, it's persistence, it's volunteers, but it's also considering, I guess, those, those novel ways to attract more volunteers is really, really hard at the moment. Uh, one of my key points in finishing was that we all have to advocate, so get out there and advocate to every level of government and whoever will listen and even those who won't, because they might eventually. <laughs> I don't think I've got anything more to offer, so I'm happy to have a chat with anybody over morning tea. But... OK, well, I'd like to thank our speakers, Daniel and Jeff. Thank you.